I, I request uh, Geeta Ramaseshan to, to begin. Uh, good evening, uh, everybody. And I have had a very enriching experience today, revisiting a lot of the law that I learned. I mean, I started my practice post-emergency, and I was so carried away by the kind of judgments that came in the 80s, especially the, from Justice Krishnayar, Justice Chinnaparedi, Justice Bhagwati, and all those rights which actually focused so much on civil and political rights with reference to our constitution, which expanded the, um, the notion of the, which expanded the scope of Article 21 and introduced so many socio-economic rights at that time, that it was a very exhilarating period for me to be a young lawyer, practice in Chennai in so many ways, where we also had in Tamil Nadu a very vibrant legal aid uh, structure and a legal aid movement where almost a large number of judges, including the two judges who were here today, were part of. However, uh, I sometimes feel I learned all this law in the last century and I'm at a loss to see how I can actually apply it today. And uh, issues that came in the morning, um, especially first with reference to the uh, presentations of Justice Chandru and Justice Kannan, um, he did, of course, speak about Stan Swami, but I actually also wanted to um, say a bit about how, apart from the fact that the UAPA and other legislations do not give any rights in terms of bail, etc. Looking at the way in which judges even at the trial court even understand, and I'm giving the examples of the trial court, even understand freedom of expression is disturbing at all times, but I just want to give you two examples. Navalkar wanted the books of P.G. Woodhouse to be read in prison, and the jail authorities refused him that. Uh, of course, uh, fortunately, the, he had to move the high court, and it came up before a judge who had probably read and understood the humor of the author and permitted it. When a seizure was made in the Bhima Koregaon case, war and peace was taken away as one of the document, and it was cited as one of the documents that would have incited the urban nexus, so to speak, to actually create this, uh, you know, to actually take that forward. There was a huge hue and cry about that. But I, uh, I want to say a very, uh, an incident that took place in Chennai before all this, you know. Um, our famous dancer, Chandralekha, was charged on sedition. And uh, when the police went to her house, they took away a lot of her letters. One of them were letters written by Sri Aurobindo. And uh, they questioned her as to who this Aurobindo was and what are these kind of letters. So when, you, when freedom of expression is getting controlled at that level, um, it's, uh, you know, however much or whatever we speak here is very, very difficult to make people understand as to what exactly is understood at that point of time. I wanted to give you the other example which Justice Chandru mentioned about Satangulam, which was a case in Tamil Nadu for many of you who don't know. Two people died in police custody. They had to be produced before the magistrate, and when they, were, when they were produced before the magistrate, they had a lot of injuries on their person. The magistrate did not come down. The magistrate was sitting in the balcony of the house. Under the law, you know, you can be uh, uh, accused, can be produced before the magistrate, even at their residence, because such is the requirement in terms of the rights of the individual when they are arrested. The magistrate did not come down, and Justice Chandru gave the example of how he asked the police whether they are all right. He, when they said yes, he died. Now, the point here is the police officers, of course, have been charge-sheeted. Cases have been registered against them. 
but we do not know and many of us as lawyers have been trying to find out what action the high court took against this magistrate who in our opinion derelicted from his duty to come down and meet the accused we just do not know what has happened the so that's how then this aspect goes on i also want i i just want to look at some of the examples that they you know that uh, that was given uh, the case pertaining to the diwali crackers which uh, chandru spoke about how you know um, um, how the right to environment and pollution was taken at one level and taken it forward now the court gave a gave a judgment saying that crackers should be fired only between this time to that time now just look at the way in which the country itself is understood now in south india crackers are fired only in the morning especially in the morning in diwali early morning in diwali all the southern states rushed to the supreme court to ask for a modification and a clarification in that order i mean, how does one actually understand this how do you actually take this forward or even bring it within this foray as uh, is a complexity or is something that is actually defeating us in many ways i just want to share with you two statistics very small statistics a statement given in rajya sabha on 29/7/2022 relating to the number of cases pending in every state just two states i'll give you as an example uh, in tamil nadu the number of criminal cases that are pending is 487672 in uttar pradesh the number of cases that are pending is 86 lakhs 53255 and you can see what is the the you know the rights we can talk about the accused we can say that they have all the rights and i keep saying that i have been telling you all in my class also but with this you you know and having a special formulation with reference to bail when all the judgments uh, chandru gave the example of colonial crpc from the colonial time to now judgments to now have established this as a right so i only want to Uh, refer two points in the discussions one is that one point that is very very problematic a of course the current uh, um, situation is that homes are divided friends are divided classes are divided everybody is divided you cannot discuss politics at home anymore because within the family people take such virulent violent positions they take so at work they take so in your homes so this i think is the greatest tragedy that has befallen us now but take for example the other issue with reference to police complaints since circulation of news makes it a ground for filing any case you express an opinion in tamil nadu in a paper or in twitter or anywhere and a case can be filed against you in assam and the police can come here and take you away and put you in jail in assam you're seeing this happening with great frequency so it's uh, forget the fact that you you know and then of course you may not even get bail this is a great challenge that is posed to us at every stage and uh, you know it's not even being discussed in our forums and most courts may not even give you what is called as transit bail now some states give and some don't so you can be arrested and taken forward and put in jail so okay the fact that cases can be filed anywhere in this large country the fact that what you stated nobody would have noticed but for the fact that a case has been filed against you and the fact that once this happens it not only kills you in the process but also has a very terrible chilling effect on everyone forget the disaster that it can cause to your family 
is, doesn't seem to be of any concern anywhere before the legal system. Uh, one thing I think um, uh, Justice Kannan did sp spoke a lot with reference to religious, the rights of religious minorities and the questions that he posed. So <coughs> especially at a later point of time, you all must think about it. How do we examine minorities' rights? How do we examine, is there appeasement politics? What should be the rights in terms of reservations with reference to Dalit Christians and the whole notion and the legislation of triple talaq which has also been mentioned now. I, uh, you know, the uh, angle of triple talaq, again, I practice also in family law and I do deal with a lot of Muslim women who have been victims of triple talaq. Many of them do welcome this legislation the issue here is that all family legislations, all matters pertaining to marriage, say bigamy, um, adultery before the repeal, uh, etc., have a ch separate chapter in the IPC and you cannot go to the police to file a complaint in those cases. You have to go only by way of a private complaint, which means you go to the magistrate court Magistrate will issue summons, the party appears before the court, and then there can be scope for negotiations, and then there is a process. But in the case of this new legislation with reference to triple talaq, even though it is a legislation relating to marriage, police powers are given. There is no question of going to the court, you just have to go to the police and give a private complaint, and is treated as if it is an offense against the state. So, exactly what, sir, you said is happening. You, you don't have to give a divorce at all, you just desert her and go. The remedy and the relief is not available at all. And now, there is a new challenge before the Supreme Court, challenging the other forms of talaq, which are valid. Um, Islamic law has two other forms of talaq and in which people are getting their divorce because triple talaq has been prohibited. Now even this has been challenged and in the absence of a legislation, where does that leave Muslim men and women? So Supreme Court entertains, entertains these matters which actually should be left at a different realm. Again, one point on the uh, aspect which um, Justice Kannan mentioned about the uh, about uh, you know the Babri Masjid uh, case as well as the legislation passed by the Narsimha Rao government which prohibited any kinds of changes in structures of worship. I don't know whether uh, everybody is aware of the fact that now recently last week the Madras High Court has given a judgment where a very old temple has now been held to be a Buddhist Vihara. And uh, they have said that the worship must stop and it should now be declared as a Buddhist Vihara. Well, it's interesting at one level to me, but then when this reopening of cases, when in fact the existing legislation should have applied, is something that, uh, you know, it, you, it's, it's running, it's snowballing in such a fast way that, uh, in a way, I'm fascinated by this judgment. In a way, I'm fascinated because lots of uh, Buddhist and Jain uh, uh, temples have been demolished in the south by the various other kings. But the fact that this judgment has come now is, it's a snowball effect of at all sides that we do not even know what and what is going to happen in more ways than one. And hence, I just wanted therefore to take this further, uh, our discussion in terms of two issues which has been made and just end in a minute. One which you very interestingly spoke about as the heckler's veto. Uh, which is how it's happening today. Anything happens, there is a huge amount of heckle and then uh, instead of protecting the right of the individual in terms of freedom of expression, the state caves in. We saw that here in Pirmar Murugan's case. 
and then of course matter went to the court and then he was allowed to you know the book was not banned we you the louder you heckle the more you shout and now there is a recent heckling with reference to a movie which which is being starred by amir khan which has started i think yeah the remake of uh, forest gum so how does one understand this heckling i mean you know for those of us who belonged to a older generation today i feel i mean as a joke you know the song dam maro dam of asha bosle would never be allowed today <laughs> to be played and would be banned so i think uh, because she has taken ram's name so you know in this way i think the especially the discussions that have come through have given ample food for thought have uh, especially the afternoon session ma'am of how you have uh, taken note of as to how do you take this uh, you know how do you release fundamental freedom of speech from a liberal project to an equality project i think that's something which i felt i can take through to me and your uh, the last point sir that you mentioned that we were never taught we never could understand that a legislation had any malefied to it we could never allege malefied to any legislation but today unfortunately every legislation that comes is completely malefied and it's not even something that we could challenge it in that way uh, to me that was a very poignant and i felt very saddened by that point that you had stated and uh, you know to take it forward in more ways than one so i thank you for this opportunity for putting forth or maybe taking forward the points made by the speakers thank you thank you very much geeta ram session before i ask vikas to speak i i should have introduced geeta you know she is a lawyer practicing in chennai in all of you many of you know but those who don't since 82 in the area of constitutional law criminal law and family law as she said trained mediator was the first joint secretary of the madras high court mediation center she has been a special public prosecutor for the cbi um she is a heinz fellow on comparative law from the university of pittsburgh and an eisenhower fellow of human rights public interest litigation and justice um and has been a guest faculty of the international human rights law at the university of pittsburgh usa an expert on international human rights law and has done training workshops for lawyers and judges in india and the asia pacific region on international human rights law fair trial standards and gender discrimination with focus on human rights treaties he has been she has been a guest faculty in the department of criminology madras university on human rights and criminal law also guest faculty in central university hyderabad on media law and ethics guest faculty on various subjects on national on the national judicial academy bhopal and uh, over and above all that uh, she is a adjunct faculty at the asian college of journalism where she teaches a course on media law and society as you know she has written extensively in newspapers and journals on legal issues and has been associated with many national campaigns on legislations relating to women and children thank you uh, gidaram session and now i am going to ask vikas pathak who teaches at our college as you know is part of our co faculty is also an alumnus of the acj and come on and now become a member of the faculty he's been a journalist for about 16 years worked with top national dailies including the hindu hindustan times indian express he's also headed the political coverage of outlook magazine and worked as editor of asia will english he's covered the bjp the rss and also parliament for over a decade he holds a phd in modern history from jnu and has authored a widely reviewed book titled contesting nationalisms vikas patak patak thank you sir yeah so uh i am basically not a trained lawyer of course i have read the constitution but uh, much of what has been said today is from a strictly legal perspective or in one case philosophy of law uh, i have been trained in history modern history and uh, therefore i would want to bring the historian's craft and of course i have been a political journalist and i have also chronicled contemporary india so primarily this whole question of say freedom of expression we have been debating how much freedom can one have and 
what does the constitution do about it? We already, already know what he has, uh, it has done about it, 191A and 192, which are at cross purposes in certain cases. So historically, we have to understand one thing. The roots of much of this go back into the 19th century, much before the constitution was made. Now, first of all, many of you may be surprised, but in pre-modern India, there are more instances of much freer expression than in India since 19th century. In fact, if I raise my memory through history that I read, I think there's only one uh, you know, case uh, in, during the reign of uh, Firoz Shah Tughlaq where a Brahmin was executed for uh, saying that Hinduism was superior to Islam or Islam was an untrue religion. But that apart, there were umpteen instances of, of not just freedom, but people being widely regarded and respected because they said things that are today considered black. Even today, children are named Kabir. There, there's a Kabir Panth even today. In the couplets of Kabir, you find, you know, what would be considered blasphemy today, both vis-a-vis -vis Islam and what would be considered insults vis-a-vis -vis Hinduism. And many of those, you know, couplets are recited and are also in school textbooks, right? Mocking the mosque, mocking the azan, uh, you know, mocking uh, uh, the tonsuring of the head by devout Hindus, all of that was there. And despite this, he was a highly regarded person and he stayed in Varanasi, right? So that nothing in what he said or wrote was considered by people as something problematic. Rather, he was seen to have a higher level of social intelligence than others. Apart from Kabir, uh, let's go to the Mughal times. In the Mughal times, there used to be a very celebrated Urdu poet, you know, and I told some students about uh, this, called Mir Taki Mir, right there in the court, or in the Mughal court. And there's one couplet which is very famous, uh, and uh, I'll just tell you what it is. Um, it says that, Mir ke dino mazhab ko, Poochte kya ho, unne to kashka khincha, dair mein betha, kab ka tark islam kiya. So basically it means that what do you ask about the religion of Mir Taki Mir? Uh, he has, you know, sported a tikka, sat in temples and renounced Islam long ago. And Mir was still quite an icon, right? Similar things happen with Ghalib. When the British come to Delhi and churches start coming up, there's a couplet of Ghalib where Ghalib actually says that my faith is stopping me but infidelity is attracting me, the Kaaba is behind me, and the church is in front of me. What happens in the 19th century now is twofold. One, the rise of technological modernity. The dissemination of the, of the printed word via the uh, printing press, that happens. Secondly, the colonial census happens, right? Which also enumerates people on grounds of religion. So, uh, what is happening now is that there's a certain concretization of community. What was fuzzier, historically, starts becoming more concrete. And once it becomes more concrete and becomes sharper, then a problem arises that, and a third thing, mass mobilization is happening. That is what modernity is all about. So masses are being mobilized, uh, printed word is being disseminated, at the same time, religious communities are getting, you know, very, very concretized. People are thinking of themselves more clearly as Hindus or Muslims or from the early 20th century, Sikhs, all that is happening. So at this time, modernity also brings the freedom of the individual, which is an idea, you know, which is a liberal idea that is uh, found across the world. Now, why is this freedom very important? This freedom is important because structurally, you have entered the modern times where there is mobilization of the masses and since community identities are sharpening, it can lead to problems including violence, right? But in India, uh, okay, first of all, freedom of expression in India, of course, we say that, you know, we have borrowed from the British constitution, we have borrowed from the American constitution, there are different aspects that we have borrowed. But according to me, freedom of expression in India comes not so much from a constitution because after all, uh, you know, our... Uh, uh, constitution makers, the prime people there happened to be political leaders and they had been freedom fighters. So the idea of freedom came actually from the nationalist press. It was practiced on a daily basis. 
They were charged for their offenses. They were sent to jail, be it Gandhi, be it Nehru, be it uh, Tilak. Many of these people, of course, Tilak was uh, not alive when the constitution uh, you know, was being made. But what, what was happening is that that freedom was something that was practiced and performed, and they also faced the consequences of it. But uh, so of obviously, the constitution had to you know, say that freedom of expression is central to democracy. But at the same time, they were doing another thing. They were forging Indian nationalism, modern Indian nationalism. And nationalism talks the language of the collective. The freedom of the individual uh, speaks about the language of the, indiv the, the, the something that is very atomistic. But nationalism demands a sense of the collective. Now, uh, uh, broadly, two senses came up in India. One was a composite culture sense of the collective, which, which was associated more with Gandhi. And the other was a very Hindu sense of collective, which is the tradition of the RSS and um, Hindu Mahasabha and uh, you know, BJP. So, but nevertheless, collective has to be there. So a constitution, when addressing a nation, actually tried to balance the individual and the collective. 19.1a addresses the individual, that you have freedom of speech and expression because after all, it's a democracy and a free country. 19.2 says that, but wait, your freedom should be exercised in such a way that the notion of the collective, because the collective also is imagining itself as an organic ent entity and has its red lines. The notion of the collective should not be hurt. So security of the state, that is the state. Then we have things like public order, we enter into the realm of the nation state. As uh, she rightly said, it's uh, the first amendment, 1951, uh, you know, uh, uh, brought public order, uh, as uh, inserted public order in 1902, and also the word reasonable before restrictions. So there's a balance here. So the balance basically states that, and, and of course, they are very, uh, you know, abstract, uh, very nebulous kind of uh, categories like uh, decency, you know, uh, morality. Now, what is decency, what is morality, we don't know. But if you think about it, it is very important because when you have forged a nation, the nation believes that it culturally values, uh, culturally it values some things. Now, those values are nebulous. It's like a cloud, you know, it doesn't have a shape. But then it is nevertheless there. So a certain kind of a cultural internality of values gets constructed in the very act of nationalism. So that cannot be hurt because uh, the constituent assembly that forged the nation has to put in safeguards. So the end result was a balancing of the freedom of expression. And who would balance it? That was left to the judiciary. So basically the, the principle is that, you know, uh, the, the court would apply its mind to the particular case and see whether, you know, the remedies is more excessive than the mischief. So then it actually is something that enters the courtroom and when it enters the courtroom, it is a judge taking a decision. So there, you know, what is the ideology of the judge? What is the orientation of the judge? Is the judge a conservative? Is the judge a liberal? And uh, the judge is also perceiving society in a certain way, right? The judges are also human beings. And just uh, as we perceive, they also perceive society in a certain way and do not want to, you know, cross a red line. That is also true. And in some big cases, it's also possible that in our country, there are post-retirement uh, you know, offices that judges hold, uh, which when the UPA was in uh, uh, power, Arun Jaitley had said in parliament that you know, this uh, desire for a Latin's bungalow uh, actually compromises the independence of the ju judiciary. And of course, uh, we have seen uh, 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 Justice Tarun Gogoi, who uh, was nominated to parliament after being Chief Justice of India. So all these influences, are likely to act on the judge. And when all these influences act on the judge, or, or maybe some of these influences act on the judge, then that is where the line of your freedom is drawn. So in that, eventually, your freedom of expression is, is potentially restricted by the idea of the sensitivity of the collective. And the person who decides whether you have violated that line happens to be a judge. So this is how the system, uh, you know, of, uh, the, the, you know, uh, the, this is how the constitution just puts it uh, in the hands of the judiciary. Justice Chandru very interestingly said in the morning, he actually pointed out to certain, you know, early, early uh, cases in which uh, uh, judges, you know, 
pronounced certain judgments in the, in the early years after independence, where you know, there was a clear hint that judges were either not independent enough or were perhaps not trying to take or wanting to take on the government. Right? Now, in this case, of course, it is, all, it is possible. We can never know because the judge will never tell you. But judges have an acute sense of two or three things. One is, is the party in power really influential and powerful? So, of course, Jawaharlal Nehru's stature was much more than any judge in India, right? Then they also see what are the people feeling, the masses feeling about this. That is also always a concern. Perhaps if in a coalition government, it's possible that uh, a judge may be more independent because the judge, you know, does not know who will come, come to power next. But when it is clear that a party is, is in a position of dominance, often it happens that judgments hold a pattern. Right now, uh, as you see, the pattern is simple. So what is happening is that there are certain core concerns, ideological concerns of, of the present regime, and which are stated, they are there in public. Many of the judgments have actually, you know, let me put it this way, very clearly. From the Jansang to the BJP, there were three core demands, right? One was Ram Temple at Ayodhya. The second was abrogation of uniform civil code. And the third demand was, uh, sorry, abrogation of 370, and the third was uniform civil code. Now, Ram Temple has come via a constitutional process, because the constitution gives the judi judiciary the right to listen to, a, to hear a title suit. So it's a constitutional Ram Temple, right? And even here, let's not forget, I'll tell you, a, 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 an, uh, you know, something that happened. Uh, when the Allahabad High Court had come up with its judgment on the Ram Temple and divided it, uh, you know, two is to one between the uh, Hindu litigants and the Muslim litigants. A day before the judgment, we were sitting in parliament, so the session was on, and uh, we were talking to, some of us journalists were talking to Arun Jaitley. What is likely to happen? So Jaitley said that what is likely to happen, I don't know, but I also don't know whether it is better if the judgment is in, in our favor or against us. So we asked why, and he says that, look, if the mosque has to come back, there is a makeshift temple that came up just after demolition. Because when the demolition happened, after that, you know, the, 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 that site was taken over by the government after some hours. In between, there was a makeshift small temple, and a priest uh, was also, you know, uh, the, the, it was also given a priest. So if you have to rebuild the Babri Mosque, you have to demolish that Ram Temple where worship is uh, being offered. So that is a fate accompli. No judge can tell you that, but that is a fate accompli because that's a clear, it will be a problem so far as public order is concerned. If that demolition happens, massive riots can take place. So eventually we had, uh, you know, a bench with four judges, including Justice Chandrachur, who's considered a very progressive judge, and unanimously the verdict gave the entire fight to uh, you know, the Hindu litigants. Secondly, Article 370, it has been abrogated by a presidential order. There's a uh, petition against it, which is lying in the Supreme Court for, th for three years. Uh, the third thing, uniform civil court, by the way, can actually come constitutionally, because the, constitu the Constituent Assembly debates were cross-ideological. So what happens is that many of the Gandhian or socialist or Hindu conservative concerns were transferred to the directive principles. They are very much, you know, uh, they're in the directive principles and any government can choose to make them a law. So the present government can actually move, introduce a bill to bring a uniform civil code that will be constitutional. I'll give you ex another example. A core concern of Hindutva has been cow protection. Cow protection was sent to directive principles, and it was Congress governments in the late 50s and early 60s in Uttar Pradesh, Madhya, Madhya Pradesh, Rajasthan, these states, that actually introduced bills and banned cow slaughter. So all this is constitutional. And as for the question of future proofing, I think there are only two ways. Because uh, the judiciary is right now, you know, a, a book does not have an intrinsic argument. You read meanings into it. So the judiciary is now reading the constitution in a way where it aligns itself seamlessly with, uh, you know, a, a more Hindutva worldview. So this is how, you know, this is what is happening. And future proofing can mean only two things. Either judges are more ind independent, 
For that, they should not have a, for any post-retirement benefit under any regime. So, but you cannot ensure the independence. There's no integrity test to be a judge. The second system is the system that happened during the emergency. What happened was that when Indira Gandhi cl clamped the emergency, there happened to be uh, the uh, person of the stature of Jay Prakash Narayan in this country, who was widely respected by people. He was also willing to go to jail, and he, the, he and many others who were freedom fighters were alive at that time, and many younger leaders or youth leaders actually fought the emergency. So, you know, you know it, it was a fight for the mind of people, and eventually they were able to displace uh, you know, the Indira Gandhi regime. Right now, the opposition is very weak. So, future proofing of anything requires an opposition because parliament is where, you know, discussions will happen and protests can also be organized by political parties. Right now, we have the weakest opposition that I think we ever had. Uh, not because of the number of seats that the BJP is getting. When Congress used to have, you know, uh, uh, 300, 350 seats in the Nehru years, there were people like, say, Ram Manohar Lohia. Ram Manohar Lohia's first speech in Lok Sabha actually calculated the, the expense on Nehru's pet dog and compared it with India's per capita income. So we don't have people like that right now. So I think future proofing is very difficult. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, Vikas, for that uh, characteristically astute comment uh, uh, as a discussant. Now the floor is open. So do. Uh, raise the questions you have, brief comments, uh, and yes. And make sure that you, are, you have a microphone. Yeah, go ahead. If the question is addressed to anyone in particular, you can say so, if it's generally addressed to the panel. My question addressed to sir. Who is sir? Mr. Oh, yeah. Kalishwaram yeah. Raj. Okay. Right. Sir, don't you think that democracy dies as per our convenience? Right. If any government we don't like, we don't run to our ideology, we, we label that government undemocratic, we, lab, we blame the post-pass system, we blame, we, we blame that the election process is wrong just because it don't, like, suits our ideology, right? So, and democracy don't die in many instances. For example, the democracies don't die when government in Maharashtra jails uh, young Marathi actor Ketki Chitkale when she shared a cartoon on Sharad Pawar. The democracy don't die when Kanan Karan is a Tamil a stunt actor who was jailed two days back for opposing a statue alongside the temple by the DMK government. The democracy don't die when West Bengal police reaches the Goa and to arrest a rapper called Dutu Roy for just commenting on Mamta Banerjee. The democracy don't die when Mangal Agarwal slapped with sedition in Chhattisgarh, right, for just, just uh, issuing, uh, just for, like raising the issue of short electricity shortages. So everything dies with our convenience. The democracy didn't die when Nehru was there, he banned books to movies to harmonium, right? We say he was such a liberal guy, right? I think, sir, we are, so don't you think we are same at, as, at the democracy level? What was we are starting and what we are right now? Just because, but, but our conveniences had, had like forced us to label anything. And how is justified to again and again blame that election process and first pass poll the system? Just because the government don't run to our wishes. Friend's name? His name is Krishna. Krishna. Uh, Krishna, I am thankful for that question. And this kind of dialectics, or rather uh, uh, method, happens uh, very often in discussions like this. And this kind of bifurcation, ourselves, and you, my ideology, your ideology. No, we said uh, almost in the entire conversations that have, uh, have been happening here, we were critical of how Nehru supported democracy, how the first amendment came, how even in my talk, we were rather critical of how 356 was used 356 was used by Nehru also. 356 was used against the first elected communist government in Kerala. Uh, Justice Chandru elaborated on that. So we have, we don't have that color blindness. 
we rather try to think about the constitutional epochs the values the unfreedom the illiberality of the state we find danger when tada was invoked pota was invoked when sedition was invoked against kodangulam activists in the same breath we say we talk about sudha bharadwaj navalekha stan swami and all the point is the to uh, while we dividing the issue in the partisan level but the fundamental difference that too is rather one cannot overlook the fundamental difference of course emergency curtail freedom but there is much difference he, after whenever it was happening there might might have been dynasty in congress but dynasty doesn't always mean cadreism even a dynastic party could be democratic in some that's why there was split in congress and that is again why such splits do not happen in the cadre organization and that becomes that makes it more dangerous that results in a kind of bigotry the politics under a demagogue were you don't feel like questioning a situation were you are on law teacher who worked for tribals in chatisgarh was incarcerated for more for about 3 years you don't find anything unusual about it and you don't find anything unusual about stan swami you don't find it, uh, anything unnatural about 10 or 12 persons continuously in jail without any constitutional court coming to their rescue then you will answer it not by advocating for their liberation but exemplifying it with some other incarceration to which we don't subscribe so that is something which is rather put to into the mouth of the liberals which the liberals do not proclaim see in a liberal democracy that's why we we say nobody is failing to rather protest emergency that's the whole theme of our discourse but we try to make distinction and that doesn't mean that one is less dangerous but we are qualitative trying to qualitatively distinguishing and analyzing them so this methodology is essentially a, a something uh, resembling a kind of uh, fascist logic uh, in the sense that this is something which uh, scholars like tarnob khaitan has been repeatedly telling thousand cuts on the constitution that is how he describes about the situation after 2014 this doesn't mean that cuts didn't didn't occur on earlier a span of time part of history it has occurred but there is difference then again this uh, you are rather unifying the regime the dispensation with one political party uh, the party government fusion no not just therun up only explain to that extent i would rather add to that there is a fusion of majoritarianism of religion of political party and of government which in a situation like this when you are not in a position to speak well because this is chennai i was just thinking that this is relatively a safer uh, place to talk about constitution and i don't know how far you will be able to tell the same thing in delhi even for that matter in a public it is very easy to invoke 124 against you or against your own colleagues tomorrow for writing something or for for telling something in the television so this had happened but that doesn't justify the repetition of the uh, menace of the of the atrocities of 
a, a, an excessive state action. We talk these things not just in terms of one party or the other party or one religion or other religion. Let us not divide. Let us take the values based on the idea of we the people of India. Not DMK or ADMK or Congress or BJP. That the, the constitutional sim constitution on the face of it, just by way of its preamble, rejects this kind of dichotomy. And if we do not understand, then who else? If the next generation doesn't say, then our generation has failed you. Don't believe us. It is for your generation to overcome this crisis by analyzing, by deconstructing the, 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 the affairs and to come to a right, proper conclusion for the betterment of the society at large and of the country at large. This is my view on that. I'm thankful to, for that question. Because that. Any, uh, another question? Someone else? Yeah, sure. See, two wrongs don't make a right. And in the examples that you gave, yes, democracy is dying there also. And definitely, I think all of us, in terms of the examples that you gave, would be protesting, would be, if we can, appear for the people who have been detained and arrested, would be definitely appear, appearing for them. See, the issue here is that I think there is, seems to be a cascading effect because of the way the center seems to be reacting. Every other state also thinks this is the best way to use these laws, right? So the challenge today for us is actually much more. And definitely the examples that you gave, yes, those are all matters that we do not approve at all. And those are also instances where we believe that um, that, the, uh, that the state power is being misused and that we need to protest very strongly. In fact, uh, just to add to that, I was just, we had uh, some many years back Dr. Binayak Sen, who as you know, spent years in jail because he was apparently helping tribals, but was seen as what we call today urban Naxal Lord. You know, the term didn't exist then. And uh, finally, when he was released, uh, in fact, we invited him for the, the convocation address at the ACJ, and he came and delivered the convocation address at the ACJ at that time. Um, so this is irrespective of, uh, and that was not under the BJP government, right? That was in the Congress, Congress government. Yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Mike. It's just a... It's Dr. Jairam. Okay. Sorry. Uh, yeah. Uh, just a, uh, you know, part comment on uh, what, uh, what uh, Dr. Anushka Singh was saying. Uh, I, if I, if I understood you right, I think you are saying that the no harm principle, which is perhaps what you meant by the liberal approach. Uh, that uh, I understood you as summarizing it in the sense that it is inadequate, that it is very limited in character and uh, it, it uh, does not go beyond a very limited uh, scope. But then your argument that uh, uh, the, it must be replaced by some uh, not the liberal principle, but by some equality standard, is not very clear that would work either. Because uh, I think we merely transpose the problem instead of expressing it as a negative, perhaps we put it in a positive sense. And uh, Sen is useful, but I believe that this distributional approach, you know, positive freedoms and negative freedoms 
don't take us as far as we want because it never addresses, for instance, uh, the fundamental inequalities of society that arise from, say, the right to property. There is no place for that uh, as far as I can see in sin. So if you are talking about specifically freedom of expression, I think we need an objective standard that to say that, uh, uh, you know, to, uh, to be non-inclusive or abusive of others is not merely providing the target, the right to counter speech, I don't think solves very much. There is an absolute sense in which it is wrong. So you need a sense of moral realism that uh, underpins your constitutional uh, vision. And obviously society is not going to reach this uh, all in one go. It is a process just like secularization is a process. Secularism does not arrive without a process of secularization. Uh, I think the term constitutionalization, uh, which was referred to in the morning's uh, discussion, which I could not hear, but from what I gather, seems uh, uh, a step in that direction. So we have to uh, uh, reach a standard. You know, We have to aspire to a standard and move towards it and constantly check between our pronouncements and uh, a moral realist standard where we are headed. And just as a final footnote, I don't think uh, Austin helps in uh, performative utterances, but that's, uh, I don't want to, what little I know of it, I don't want to get into that. But this is my, we need some objective standards and some moral realist view that underpins of what is uh, freedom of expression and what is right and wrong in speech. Thank you. Thank you. Um, actually, thanks for the question that allows me a lot of clarification, to give a lot of clarifications. I'm precisely arguing um, um, in the same vein as you're asking. I'm precisely saying that there has to be an objective criteria. Um, and um, the objective criteria can be drawn by disaggregating the notion of harm. The, the point at which I begin to critique the, the existing Indian standard vis-a-vis -vis the conception of harm is the dominant idea of harm as related to public order and security of state and so on and so forth. That as long as you do not see a speech to be interfering or being detrimental to these, these notions which lack an objective uh, identification, so public order itself is an undefined category in law, it's because of our understanding of speech as being restrictive only in relation to these is where we are at a problematic stage. So what we need to then do is move beyond this public order conception. And in order to do that, um, a distinction needs to be made between, um, I'm drawing some of the legal scholars who make a distinction between harm and offense, Joel Finberg being the most prominent name here, that a lot of things are offensive to you, but just because something that is offensive is hurled at you, that does not mean that you're harmed by it. Huh? So insult to religion, which I is a subjective, uh, a psychological state that, that I may experience, is not necessarily going to harm me. And how do I define harm? It's a certain impairment to an interest, a legally recognized interest of mine. So I am, if a, if a certain speech leaves me at a disadvantageous position compared to where I was, then I'm harmed. But if a certain speech offends me, but does not leave me at a disadvantaged position, I would not consider to be in harm. What we, where we are in terms of the Indian standard is that the idea of harm is understood in relation to public order and security of state. But when it comes to other kinds of criteria wherein restriction of speech can be imposed, we lapse into the hurt and the offense kind of distinction. So 
which is precisely what Heckler's veto. I will not allow this film to be uh, screened because, well, it hurts, it offends my religious sentiments. And the problem is that Indian law allows for that kind of mobilization to galvanize into a certain legal moment because insult to religion, etc., is actually an identified criteria. So what that objective criteria is to make the distinction between harm and offense, and then bring in other parameters to identify harm, which is harm to the vulnerable target, which is why, and you know, I'm glad that you're disagreeing because unless how will the conversation happen, but the idea of the vulnerable target needs to be the beginning point because right now the Indian law seems to work with the fact that all targets are, play, are placed at an equal footing. So in sedition, state, the government is the target who has all the wherewithal to respond to the, to the speaker and a, 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 a subject, a, a, a woman who is uh, depicted a certain way in a, in a pornographic expression is also placed similarly along with the government in terms of being targeted. The law is supposed to respond in a similar manner to protect the target which is the government and the target which is the woman or a member of a vulnerable community. So what we then need to do is do away with this kind of um, a, a liberal identification of I have the right to speak and as long as you're not harmed uh, in terms of some objective criteria called public order, I should be allowed to speak. No, there are other kinds of harm that people experience which do not get expressed in a heckler's veto kind of a manner. It might, something that you say can create a discriminatory practice about me, about my community, in which is not going to find expression in me being uh, 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 aggressive about the fact that, you know, I'm being discriminated. It might actually have a cascading effect in terms of silencing my entire community. What is the Indian law doing to identify that notion of harm and to bring in a certain legal remedy to address that, which is why I took the example of POA. It's the step in the right direction because it's looking at restricting speech, but not from the point of view of uh, a liberal uh, threshold of what is acceptable, what is acceptable, but from the point of view of how do you create a threshold for speech where you limit speech in order to promote equality, a Dwokinian kind of an idea on, on limitation. So, so that's where I am. And uh, just, just by way of the last thing, why do I think that this works is because the constitutional culture of India already provides for that kind of an understanding wherein you know, even the right to religion is not the Western idea of right to religion, it's a strict separation. There is interference of the state and the religion in order to promote equality of religion. I'm, so when I call for a positive conception of freedom, I'm invoking the same constitutional culture wherein the state can intervene in order to promote equality in matters of free speech rights as well. And so, so you're right that sane doesn't work in terms of positive idea, negative idea of freedom, because, so not sane in terms of the methodology of implementation, but sane in terms of the invocation of the idea of capacity building. How will you create a public sphere? By building the capacity, not through you know, giving people what they don't have, but allowing, by, by allowing the state to create that kind of public culture in which eventually regulations would be made redundant, but I agree that there I'm being very idealist. But then if academia is also devoid of idealism, I don't know where we would be go, so. <laughs> right. Any, any, uh, any other questions we just have? Yeah, maybe two questions left, and then we'll so have we to wrap up. Take all the questions, no? Shall we do that? Should we, yeah, let, maybe we can take, take both the questions and then uh, have a, Response. C carry on, uh, Arun. Yeah. yeah uh, I just want to wonder one thing: if, uh, whether freedom of expression can also be extended to mean uh, freedom to offend. Okay. The did you have a question, the person in front? Yeah. Um, sorry, my question is a little longish one. I'd like to give a context to the question before asking it. Um, I mean, a time like this where we are plagued by several climatic emergencies, 
uh, pandemic only being a strain in of this uh, emergency situations. We also have, like during the pandemic, we had many people coming in rescuing for each other, right? We had communities standing up for communities, um, doing a lot of things for each other where you didn't have any kind of political party coming up to the front and you know helping people. People themselves were uh, collecting oxygen cylinders and going to uh, rescue other people in a sense. Um, you also have, on one hand, you have this uh, community-oriented uh, practice in the sense where people are coming in rescue for people. On the other hand, you have um, several islands submerging under the sea because the water levels are rising. I mean, if you look at Sundarbans, you have several islands which are going down the water, families are having to migrate. I mean, in the near future, we might see there would be several uh, climatic migrations, borders might change, nations might uh, change, right? So how does constitution or rural democracy or free speech actually stands vis-a-vis -vis the, the, the climatic emergencies that we are going to encounter with in the future? Thank you. Okay. Uh, any other last? We'll just have one more question after this, if there is. All right. Well, after, after that. Okay. All right. Then uh, we'll, we'll respond to these questions. Uh, anyone would like to? The first question was the right to offend. Is that also right of free, free speech? Yeah. So Gautam Bhatia's book, which is titled as Offend, Shock and Disturb, is, is take somewhat the same line of argument, make the distinction and allow certain kinds of expressions which walk within the domain of the offensive to be tolerated. Now, I wouldn't want to, if you personally ask me, I wouldn't want to be formulated it as a right to offend. I think public sensibilities need to be cultivated around the fact if we are to create an equal, equitable public sphere where you wouldn't want to offend someone, you wouldn't want it to be granted to you as a right to offend anyone, but disagreements which lapse into the offensive should be tolerated is how I would put it, which then should exclude the domain of the harm. The right to harm should not be uh, formulated as a right, nor should the right to offend, but offensive needs to be tolerated is how I would put it. Let me add a devil's advocate question to that. Isn't a freedom of speech and expression, why does it need to be protected unless it is only to protect the right to offend? Otherwise, it's like you breathe and you walk and you, I mean, it's, it's a natural right, right? Why is it a stipulated right? Why it needs to be a right is because you must have the right to say something which someone doesn't agree with, which, which by, its nature, by its nature becomes offensive. Which then gets us into the semantics of disagreement and offense. So what is offensive and what is uh, simple disagreement? The, manner, the, the moment you formulate it as the right to offend, it seems like you are necessarily making it adversarial, acrimonious, contentious, which is not what right to, right to offend should be about right to criticize, right to disagree, right to condemn. But why offend? What is it that the, offen the, the vocabulary of offense adding to the domain of right to free speech that is not covered by some of these other things that democracy as a concept already embodies, which is disagreement and criticism. So I'm, I'm also trying to think aloud. So what is it that offense has a, as a, as a Can I add that? Me, Let me, yeah. shall she give you a small example? Yeah. Trawling of women in the most abusive language. Yeah. yeah? Uh, how would, it is definitely offensive. Then it falls into her, your argument on That would be hate speech. Well. You, you can't, how do you distinguish all no, that? I think I'm saying we need to, because there is hate speech and there is offense. In fact, uh, Kalishwaram Raj, and I mean, I, I'm, I'm on a Bill Dickens in the intervening petition in the Sudarshan um, TV case, where I think they were arguing that the right to offense includes right to offend, it's just intrinsic as part of right to speech, freedom of speech, which uh, ipso facto includes uh, right to, I mean, uh, hate speech, I, was, I mean, or words, of the, not, not quite in as many words, but that seemed to be the spirit of it. So I, I wonder, you know, because whether, uh, I know this is 
it, it's also culturally relative, relativist. What is offensive speech here? What is offensive speech in Sweden? What is offensive speech in, you know, so uh, I would, uh, I would try to bat on this on the side that- Impairment of interest <laughs> works as an identifying criteria. Right. So what leaves me at a disadvantage is position in terms of not how I feel, but how I'm placed. So, which in is- In a cultural context. In a cultural, in, in a social context, I mean. Cultural relativism is a dangerous ground, right? <laughs> okay, uh, one question. Uh, we have saw this, in fact, I, I was discussing the, about the karaoke on the students and I put this question to them. Lina Ma Mani uh, showed Kali smoking and that is part of her artistic freedom. Now, supposing some artist decides to show Guru Nanak smoking, where uh, smoking is taboo among Sikhs, so, do you need to distinguish between the two? Could you repeat that? Yeah. Which, is, which is what the offense harm distinction would be? Insult, so you belong to a certain religion and a religious figure of that particular community has been insulted. How does that leave you at a disadvantage position? Which would be your social standing as a member of that community. So that, which is what I argue, is in the domain of the offensive not in the domain of the harm. So that distinction is what the law clearly needs to make if, if it needs to progress towards an equality. The second question from Ushumaya, that was one who asked the question, right? About changing uh, climate, change. Uh, climate change and, you know, we are talking about boundaries, all that is, you know, the future, not, nothing of that is going to exist. What are we talking about? Is that in, in some what you're saying? Yeah. I assumed you were going to speak to that. <laughs> yeah, I think that, that question is... Um, may I yeah, because... Yes. So basically, you know, uh, what your concern is, that concern is part of technological modernization it has brought it about. So, uh, well, one has to find a balance or decide, because the point is, many of these things, the climatic uh, the concerns, are concerns that have been brought up in, in the 19th and 20th centuries, via state policies, industrialization and many other things. So eventually, we have to kind of, you know, decide there has to be a social consensus or consensus among policymakers as to how do you balance the need for, uh, quote unquote, either capitalist or st state sponsored big development and the long term dangers that it will bring. That's it. So they have to decide that. In fact, I wonder whether Dr. Jairam wants to respond to that, because he's the environment expert here. <laughs> Can you give up the mic? I, I was really hoping to stay out of that. Uh, I think uh, the no harm principle, I think, uh, works much better in the environmental domain so it would seem at first sight. But I think uh, it depends on how you ask the question. So is technological modernization, whether state-sponsored or otherwise, versus what uh, non-modernization, refusal to modernize, is that the question in the first place? Second thing is, there is on the one hand, uh, say, a no harm principle, perhaps, in the right of quote-unquote communities. But there is a no harm principle which is ignored in the fact that development at the rural level, without development, without modernization, caste, you know, inequality, social and economic inequalities are not dealt with. Ambedkar had uh, quite strong words to use on the nature of rural society. So non-development is, is a harm principle, harm situation of a kind, whereas technological uh, modernization can dispossess communities. So I think uh, here the question is, we have to take into account, I believe, two things. One is that we uh, have to find the material basis for the fact that these two things do not 
polite. So for instance, technology. Technology of the right kind. Technology, I won't use the word appropriate because it's used differently, but technology that meets needs and uh, uh, well-being, but at the same time does not mean that we turn our back on technology. That's one thing. Second thing is there is always, all this happens in a context of larger socio-economic inequality. And there, the freedom of expression, however much it is given in the Constitution, doesn't work in practice. And uh, environment is a very clear case of that. So we need the socio-economic conditions under which people have a right to decide and there is some kind of social arrangement or uh, legal, with its legal ramifications, where we can have a collective decision about how to go forward. But that presupposes a society with much le less levels of inequality than what we are faced with. So this is the context in which we have to figure this out. I don't think there are any easy answers, but it is the same problem I was referring to when I was saying that uh, uh, there is a, a process by which, you know, both in terms of freedom of expression, the recognition uh, of what is right and wrong, as well as in this uh, case, it's a process, a social process that has to be undergone. Thank you. I think we have uh, kind of exceeded our time, partly because we crossed uh, the time. Okay, uh, so we'll just, Krishna has been raring to ask something, so we'll just t take that as a last question, unless it's a very provocative question and we have to spend the rest of the evening here. Okay. <laughs> I just want to respond, so when I uh, mentioned these names, my idea is that whenever there's some liberal discourse like this, I don't see these names coming. I always see the names of Siddiq Kappan, Stan Swami. I don't really see these names come. When I see the case of Nupur Sharma and Zubair, right, both are accused for hurting religious sentiments. But there are a big uh, sec section of liberals who want to see Nupur Sharma in jail, but, but stand with the Zubair, right? Both are accused for the same thing. Either both did wrong, either none of them did bad, right? So I I'd see that people are not agreeing with the principle. Let's stick to the principle that 295 must go. Let's aim for the uh, absolute freedom of expression. We don't see that. We just see that people take sides. Either one section supporting Nupur, one section supporting Zubair. Right? So why don't we stick to the principles? Let, let's all go in the principle. Let's go with the 295A. Why the hypocrisy? And I don't think this hypocrisy only is it's, it's actually cuts with all the problem. Okay. Anyone want, wants to respond to that? <laughs> she, she. <laughs> Geeta says she'll do it in class, and that's not a threat. She, she's just saying she'll, she'll explain it to you. <laughs> okay, we'll, we'll have to leave it there. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Ah, go ahead. Ah, thank you for this session, and uh, we'll have the uh, last piece of action. Thank you for making this session so, so interactive with all your questions and comments. We would now like to invite Dr. Nalini Rajan, the Dean, Asian College of Journalism, to propose a vote of thanks. Thank you, uh, everyone, and good evening to one and all. And I'm sure you'll all agree with me that this has been a series of fascinating discussions. Um, and it is my happy duty to deliver the vote of thanks. So uh, let me begin by expressing our deep gratitude to Justice Chalameshwar, I think he's just stepped out, he's gone, he's left now, for taking the time out to come here to our college to deliver a most illuminating lecture on the Constitution and democracy. Equally, I would like to thank uh, Justice uh, K. Chandru and Justice uh, K. Kannan for their profound discussion. I mean, this was a fascinating uh, discussion, I think, uh, something that where we, there are a lot of takeaways from uh, these uh, discussions on the Constitution, the judiciary, and democracy. Special thanks uh, go to distinguished author and Supreme Court lawyer, Kalishwaram Raj, for his um, 
talk on future proofing. You know, the, this last session on future proofing the Constitution, I think uh, the, perhaps one of the most, I mean, the way you ended it was most poignant, I thought. This whole idea of when you reach rock bottom in terms of democratic practice, and I know that there'll be some objections in the class to what I say now, but you know what you said about this Gramscian quote, the whole idea of the pessimism of the intellect. Yes, what can you think about? What can you, uh, you know, talk about? The pessimism, pessimism of the intellect and the optimism of the will. So when you reach rock bottom, I suppose you need to muster the will to get up and just move forward. Um, I also wish to thank, of course, uh, uh, definitely uh, Indra Chandrasekhar, who's the publisher of Tulika Books, for facilitating the book release uh, of Mr. Kalishwar and Raj's uh, latest book, Constitutional Concerns, Writings on Law and Life. We owe a special debt of gratitude to several participants in the colloquium. Mr. N. Ram and Mr. Shashi Kumar for chairing different sessions and for enabling these very lively discussions. Uh, I would also like to thank uh, Dr. Anushka Singh uh, for a talk you know, on this very important uh, subject. And I think this uh, fascinating <laughs> Uh, link that you make between uh, philosophy's linguistic turn and the judiciary and judicial practice. Thank you for that. And uh, we also have uh, our discussants. We have our uh, uh, two discussants in this session with very, with very uh, I wouldn't say very different perspectives, but certainly varying perspectives, legal expertise on the one hand and also historical uh, world view. Uh, thank you, Geeta Ramaseshan and Vikas Patak. And our reporter, uh, Anjana Krishnan, who's quietly, I know, uh, doing a job uh, in, the in the audience, sitting in the audience. And she should be soon initiating the process of creating documentation pertaining to today's discussion. Uh, this colloquium would not have been possible without the tireless efforts of our administrative and technical staff. Uh, you know, uh, uh, for days they have been working on this, and honestly, I think all that has been, all the proceedings, all the fascinating work, this is possible because of their efforts. I also need to take the opportunity to thank our canteen staff for providing us with excellent sustenance throughout the day. And uh, finally, uh, last but not least, many thanks to our student MC here, Gezu. Thank you. <laughs> and last but not least, everyone in the audience, thank you very much for being here and for all your questions. Thank you indeed, very much indeed. Have a lovely evening. Thank you. <laughs>